All right, today our free offer is number 152. It's called Riches of Grace, and you can call the number on the screen for this little booklet, Riches of Grace, free offer number 152. The number is one 866 788 3966. Patience, the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. How many of you have patience? Uh, Here's another one. Uh, Patience, endurance, steadfastness, and fortitude in circumstances that cannot be changed. There's another one for you. Uh, How about this one? Great or long-tempered, the ability to stick with things and not to be derailed by adversity, having patience with people. Boy, as I think of some examples of patience, I can't help but think of some of the stories that we've been hearing this past week about, about Haiti and the terrible disaster that's been happening there. I read a story about a young man who was trapped under a school building. He had been back to visit the school that he had attended. You may have read this story. And, and um, as he was there, the earthquake happened, and he was trapped as the building fell down around him. Well, there was a, there was a Toyota SUV that was there, apparently, and, and right by where he was, and somehow it kind of cushioned the collapse of the building, and around him there was a bubble, at least around part of him. Part of him was stuck. And as he began to call out, his family and some of his friends heard his cries and came and and crawled through the the rubble and they found him and they began to chisel away piece by piece, propping up the building so that it wouldn't fall down on them as well and, and, and then taking a torch and cutting away at this truck and where he was, where he was stuck. A group of about 100 bystanders gathered outside watching, wanting to see what would happen. And, 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 and they, would, they would watch and they would hear the sounds and, and, and the building would sometimes seem like it was going to fall even more. One time a piece of concrete fell out on the street and people jumped. And, 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 but finally they pulled this young man out, freed him completely. They rushed him to a truck and they took him to the hospital. Patience. Boy, I'll tell you what, evidenced in this story both by the rescuers and the rescued, right? Then there was a story of the young woman. I, I read or actually saw the video on, on the, um, one of the news networks. And uh, here she was, trapped for over two days, over two days in the rubble. Finally, she was rescued. Think about that. Patience, perhaps. As she was carried away, her words were this. She said, I never stopped praying. And I thought of patience when I heard that. She had it. She had endured. She had accepted her suffering, apparently without getting angry or upset or giving up, and she had been rescued. But it also made me think of of this. It, It made me think of what patience does not guarantee. In both of these cases, patience did not guarantee that either of these people would end up being rescued, did it? Didn't guarantee that. Many others trapped under those collapsed buildings died this week. Some are still alive and some will die. It's a sad reality that some will not be rescued. And even their patient endurance will not guarantee their rescue. Patience does not necessarily cut short our suffering, does it? And the history of the people of Haiti is a very relevant example of this trial after trial The story of Job, another example, one where we see his story from at least four different perspectives. We see it from God's perspective. We see it from the perspective of the adversary, the devil, don't we? And we see it from Job's perspective, and then here we are now looking at it from our perspective. And we see how, again, patience does not guarantee that our suffering will be cut short. And and, and Job, I think his patience is evidenced by those words in Job 13, verse 15, you've You've heard them before, and he said simply this. He said, though God slay me, yet I will still trust him. Even if it comes to the ultimate, the ultimate catastrophe, the thing that we as humans have no recourse once we face, that thing called death, Job said, listen, I'm still going to trust God. I'm still going to have a 
enduring patience. So the lesson here, if you're following along the fruits of the Spirit this week, obviously talking about the fruit of the Spirit called patience, right? Uh, it, if you read there on Sunday's lesson, I really liked this one line. It simply said this. It says, the real test in patience is not in the waiting, but in, one how, be, in how one behaves while waiting. Isn't that true? The real test is not in the waiting. It's not in the fact that we go through trials because everyone goes through trials. But it's in how we respond to the waiting, to the trials, to the things that we face. I don't know about you, but I want to be more patient. That's kind of a scary thing to say, though, isn't it? Because you never know what that means. Well, it, it, this also, as I was thinking about patience this week, and, and you know, just looking at the, the world that we live in, we all have things that we endure, that we go through, that are just, they, they build that thing called patience, or they don't, depending on how we respond. Uh, it made me think of what patience is not. And I think it's important to point this out as we start this little journey through the Bible here this morning. First of all, patience in bad circumstances is not playing the victim card, if you know what I mean. Um, in other words, it's not simply throwing up our hands and saying, uh, I can't do anything about this, if in fact we can do something about the circumstances. Does that make sense? In other words, if I'm in a situation where maybe my behavior is bringing about my trial, and I have an opportunity to change my behavior, should I do it? Of course, I can't say, well, God, come on, you're supposed to, you know, get me through this and give me the patience I need to get through this. Well, no, we can't play the victim card. That's not patience. Patience, again, going back to one of the definitions, I think the lesson brought this out, is steadfastness, endurance, and fortitude, and then it said in circumstances that cannot be changed. That's really the true definition of patience. One other thing that patience is not. Patience does not involve allowing undisciplined people to overrun our appropriate personal boundaries and that we have set up in our life. Because, you know, even Jesus had boundaries, didn't he? Even Jesus said, no, listen, that's inappropriate. The, there, he, had a, he had a mission to accomplish, for example, and when the people of Nazareth wanted, wanted to throw him over the cliff, Jesus didn't just say, okay, go for it. The Holy Spirit, the angels made it possible for Jesus to walk through the crowd and escape, right? So my point is, is that boundaries are appropriate in life, and, and we don't want to let, allow our lives to be lived at the whim of others if we can set up appropriate boundaries that keep that from happening. But here's the thing. Patience teaches us to respond in a different way than people in the world respond when other people cross their boundaries or do things inappropriately to them. And really, that's what patience is all about. Instead of responding with anger, with aggression, patience teaches us to respond in a kind, firm, gentle way to those who exasperate us. So, let's talk about patience today. Let's go to Sunday's lesson, I think it is here. And it begins very appropriately. This is so, so appropriate because it says patience is an attribute of God. And really, just think about it for a minute, where do we get patience from? Do we manufacture it within us? What are we talking about this, this quarter? What is it? The fruits of who? The Spirit. All of this is a result of God's Holy Spirit working in my life, working in your life, isn't it? We cannot expect to manufacture the fruit of the Spirit on our own. So, going to Exodus chapter 34, that passage there, so, so powerful. Let's read that. It actually describes this attribute as part of God's very character, the essence of who he is. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Moses on the mountain. God comes by. He reveals his character to Moses. Then the Lord passed by in front of him. And he proclaimed, here's how God describes himself. This is God's resume, if you will. He says, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. 
The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. That's the New King James Version. That word long-suffering there is, is really, really another definition of the word patience. It means to suffer long under, under bad circumstances, and yet you don't complain, you don't give up. This is God. This is what, how he describes himself. And, and amazingly enough, um, God gives himself, he, he gives us pictures of himself throughout the Bible. Prime example, the lesson actually brought this out, was the story of Nineveh. Remember the Ninevites? If you'd like to go back and research the Ninevites sometime, I, I would encourage you to do that. They were a very wicked group of people. Not your, you know, just kind of nominal religious person over here. They were pretty wicked. They were evil. They were known for their wickedness. And so that could have been one of the reasons why when Jonah was told by God, hey, I want you to go and have an evangelistic series down in Nineveh, Jonah. I know it's going to be tough, but set your tent up and start preaching. Jonah's like, you kidding me? I am not going to, that's the last place I'm going. I'd rather be in a whale in the belly of a stinking fish than go to Nineveh, God. Well, I don't know if he figured out that 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 was what was going to happen, but that's where he ended up, and it was only after a few days that he said, okay, I give up. I'll go to Nineveh, God. He ends up in Nineveh, and if you think about it, it's an amazing story. Here they are, the most, some of the most evil people alive on the earth at that time. Otherwise, God wouldn't have said, I'm going to destroy you, right? They were extraordinary sinners, experts in iniquity. And yet, the God of heaven, who is sinless, perfect, iniquity can't even stand before his eyes, it's consumed. He stooped down to care about this wicked people, enough to send them a warning message. And so Jonah actually, go to Jonah, read what he said. Jonah's like, he comes up with every excuse in the book, you know that, right, along the way. And finally, he gets to the end of his 40 days of preaching, or however long he preached, he walked through a few days, and, 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 and he sat down, you know the story, and as he sits there, he realizes that the time has passed, God has not yet destroyed Nineveh. This is Jonah chapter 4. A little book of Jonah there as you go towards the New Testament, chapter 4 and verse 2. And he said this, he said to God, God, I know. Uh, I pray to you, he says, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and uh, abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. One who relents from doing harm. One who is long-suffering. That is who God is. The lesson made this very apt observation here, Sunday's lesson. They said if God struck out people as quickly as humans frequently do, we'd all be dead. True, isn't it? Tell you what, I am so happy that God doesn't treat me like I sometimes treat other people when it comes to patience. Um, You remember the story, Matthew chapter 18. Remember that time when the servant came in, he owed his master a lot of money, the servant is forgiven, huge debt, debt he could never pay off. He worked his whole life. And um, he goes out, and the very first person he finds that owes him a little bit of money, enough that the person could work it off, pay it off in a couple of days, he begins to choke him and say, pay me now or I will throw you into prison. That's us, isn't it? We do that sometimes. We have to admit it. And so if God treated us like we do each other, we wouldn't have a very good, uh, very much hope of salvation, would we? Well, someone out here today has the verse, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Who has that one for us? Okay. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to read that for for us, Rhonda. Um, And so here's the question. Why is God patient with sinners? Have you ever thought about it? And perhaps there are more reasons than just one, but let's read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and let's let's, uh, find out at least one of those reasons. In the King James Version, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord, Okay, start over. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, 
that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning this promise, as some might account for slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you. So, for God, things are a little bit different than they are for us in many ways. This, first, uh, of course, mentions in verse 8 there how for God, a thousand years, it seems like a long time for us, but God actually works with people, with groups of people, for many centuries oftentimes, doesn't he, before his patience wears out. We're going to talk about how sometimes God's patience done, does run out, we could say. And, um, but look what, look what it said there. It said, God, the reason that God is so long-suffering and patient with us is because he wants us to repent. He wants us to come to him. He loves us. That's the, the true reality of what's going on with God. Have you seen this in your own life? Have you seen the reality of this truth in your own life? For me, God has given me tangible evidence of his patience with me when I have failed him yet again. Have, have you experienced that in your life? And the way he does this for me is that when I know I fail God, I do not deserve his forgiveness, and yet God forgives me. And he gives me that sense of peace and joy that I had before. I don't deserve it. I'm not, I'm not worthy of it. But yet God does that. And so look back into your own life. And, and I think when we do that, it helps us to also be more compassionate with other people around us. I think it, it should at least. So going on, let's ask this question. So here we are. We're talking about how God deals with, with us and with sinners with the people of Nineveh, we're talking about patience being an attribute of God. And, and so now I want to ask you this question. What is your picture of God? Do you view God like this? Do you view God as the God who reaches out to save the Ninevite people, those wicked people? Is that your picture of God? Or, or perhaps have you had a picture of God that's different than that? Do you view God as someone who's vengeful? And the moment someone ticks him off, man, he is coming to get them. Is that your view of God perhaps? Some people in our world, they, they view God that way, and I think we see that in the world around us because a lot of people look at Christians and they say, if your God's like that, I don't want to be with your God for eternity, right? You probably read those old-time sermons of preachers like Jonathan Edwards who described God as holding sinners above the fires of hell like a spider ready to drop them in and roasting them there as they screamed and writhed in pain. And, 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 and people who see a God like that, they say, do I want to be with a God that's going to do this for eternity for one lifetime's worth of sin? That's ridiculous. And I would agree with them. So what's your picture of God? And You know, I, a few months ago, um, and if we could throw those slides up on the screen, uh, I shared with you a little illustration that talks about how our viewpoint on something can really make a big difference in how it shows up to us. And so Cheryl, if you guys have those slides back there in the studio, um, we'll put those up on the screen here whenever you have them. How we view God makes all the difference in the world. And while they're getting those ready, I'm going to show you something really quick. You've probably seen this picture before. This is a very classic illustration of this concept. What do you see in this picture? And so some people will look at this picture and they'll see a, um, let's see, who sees the old lady? Let's raise your hand if you see the old lady here. All right, some, some of you see the old lady. Now, I, I remember when I first saw this, I could not see one of them. I think it was the old lady. I was just like, I don't see her. And then, how many of you see the young lady with the feather in her hat? You see that one? And so, it really makes all the difference. If you see the old lady, you might think, man, grumpy old lady, right? If you see the young woman, you might think, oh, there's a fancy little lady with a feather in her hat, right? All the difference in the world. How we view God is the same way. It can make all the difference in our spiritual experience and how we treat others depending on how we see him. Um, let's throw it up on the screen. Look at this. This is a paragraph that can be taken at least one of two ways. He is a young man yet experienced in vice and wickedness. He is never found in opposing the works of iniquity. He takes delight in the downfall of his neighbors. He never rejoices in the prosperity of his fellow creatures. He is always ready to assist in destroying the peace of society, and you've read this before, and this guy does not sound like a very nice person, does he? No pleasure in serving the Lord. He is uncommonly diligent in sowing discord among his friends and acquaintances, 
and so on and so forth. So, when asked to put punctuation to this paragraph, as people do it, the uh, natural way to do it, they found, is to punctuate it like this. He is a young man, yet experienced in vice and wickedness, period. He is never found in opposing the works of iniquity. He takes delight in the downfall of his neighbors. He never rejoices in the prosperity of his fellow creatures. Again, a very unpleasant person to be around. Wouldn't you agree? Bad guy. Now, you can change the punctuation, though, and it makes all the difference in the world. Go to that next slide. He is a young man, yet experienced. In vice and wickedness, he is never found. In opposing the works of iniquity, he takes delight. Different person, isn't it? In the downfall of his neighbors, he never rejoices in the prosperity of his fellow creatures, and so on and so forth. Different person, just by putting the comma in a different place. And I think this illustrates a truth, that how we look at something makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? In the same way as looking at this paragraph differently, depending on where you put that comma, how we see God can make all the difference in how we treat others on this earth. If we see God as quick to punish, as vengeful, as angry, as impatient, we'll probably feel justified in acting that way toward other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. If, on the other hand, we see God as who he really is, I want to become more like him. And I think that will happen. It will we'll become more like him if we see him as he really is. That's why John, John 17, verse 3 said, and this is life eternal, that they may know you. See, when we get to know God, we'll actually start to act like him and eventually we'll live with him. So now we go to Monday's lesson. And, and this really kind of is the uh, segue here to what we're talking about on Monday because, boy, I'll tell you what. It's one thing to talk about patience. It's one thing to realize that God is patient, but it's, it's often a different thing to actually be patient, isn't it? It's often a different thing to actually be patient when it comes to being patient in the church. Let's go. I think someone here has the verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Okay, right over here. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 talks about the way that God wants us to live in the church. So go ahead and read that for us. Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Thank you very much. So, they asked in the, the lesson, they said, okay, so... Um, how is patience linked to the other attributes presented here? And if you read that, it says, um, so walk worthy of the calling which, with which you've been called, in verse two, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. So patience is kind of a, it's a part of what's happening here, with, of everything that's happening here, isn't it? And if you think about it, the church really requires this. I mean, life within the church requires this. Um, the idea of church is amazing. You have people of every age, of every culture, of every socioeconomic background, um, all coming together and saying, we want to fellowship together and do things together and minister together and be together. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it. People don't just do that on their own. Usually you hang out with people that are kind of, they have the same interests pretty much in everything. Well, and really that's what, Christians have is they have the same interest in Jesus. That's what does unite us, right? But as we come together with these different backgrounds and personalities and different ways of living life, you think patience is a necessary attribute? Better believe it is, right? If you have any doubt, go on a mission trip sometime with a bunch of church members. You'll find out. Um, And uh, so no wonder Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, right? By how you treat each other, how you love each other. That's really, I mean, it, it boils down to it. This is an amazing thing. A bunch of people, different, coming together. They love each other. That is incredible. The world can't get it. And so that's why it's so, such a testimony. And so patience is needed in the church. The lesson asked this question. 
they said, all right, so in the church you have people that are at different levels of their walk with Jesus. They're at different maturity levels. Does that make sense? Some people are, they've been in with Jesus for quite a few years. They've got a lot of things figured out. But maybe you have someone who just came to Jesus or just became a, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, for example, in our faith community, and, and, and they don't understand some of the things that those of us who've lived in it for a while longer have. How do we deal with that? Um, the lesson said this. It said, often the mature are unwilling to give the immature the same amount of time and study to reach their level of knowledge and understanding. They're like, come on, grow up faster. What's wrong with you? So how do we deal with that? And, and so the lesson put a couple of verses out here for us to think about. Go to Romans chapter 14. This is a, a good passage. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Romans 14, by the way, is a very good chapter. Some people try to kind of misuse it to say, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. But actually, look what it says. It's basically saying there are some issues that we need to just let people decide it's between them and God. So verse 1, Romans 14. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Accept these people who are weak. They're growing. They're still not quite where you're at in their walk with Jesus. That's hard to do sometimes. But the Bible tells us to do that. We're not dealing here with big fundamental issues. We're dealing here with conscience issues. Things that God doesn't give us a clear thus saith the Lord on. So on those types of things, Paul says, listen, don't be so quick to start pushing your opinion down other people's throat. It's not the way that we're supposed to do it in the church. Now, 15 verse 1 is another verse the lesson brought out. It said, now, we who are strong, this is Romans 15 verse 1, one chapter over, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. So if you're spiritually strong and you know that, your job is to bear the weaknesses of those who are weaker than you. And um, let us be praying about how we can do that because that is such such an important thing within the community of faith. Well, the lesson moved on. It said, all right, so listen, it might be one thing to come to church once or twice a week, maybe even three or four times a week, and to be patient. All of us can deal with people that irritate us a little bit for a little while, right? It's another thing, oftentimes, to be patient at home, isn't it? People that are in your face, people that are there all the time, is, is that a little more challenging? Of course it is. And so as it has been said before, hey, listen, if you can live it at home, you can probably live it anywhere else, right? And it's true. I, I think it's very true. If we can be patient at home with those who are always there, then we can likely be patient with others as well. And of course, again, going back to how has God been patient with you, does that, thinking about that, will it help us to become more patient with others? I think it will. Well, just this last week, I uh, heard a prominent television evangelist make the comment that Haiti got what it deserved when it had this terrible earthquake and disaster this past week. Um, they had, centuries ago, he said, made a pact with the devil when they got their independence from France, I guess, and um, and this was the, just, uh, the next in the, in the list of, of uh, judgments from God that is falling upon Haiti. And, and, and while we do not really know God's perspective on Haiti and what has happened there, honestly, I think we do know that there are some truths in the Bible that can guide us in a situation like this. And so if we, we ask the question like this, we say, if, if the Lord treated us um, as we treat others or want to treat others, what do you think would be our fate? Boy, well, I, I was, what I'm referring to as far as the guidance in the Bible is the story in Luke chapter 13. Listen to this. This actually is very, very apropos. Uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now on the same occasion, there was some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Something bad had happened to some people that those who were there knew. And Jesus said to them, verse 2, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners 
than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Do you think they were worse than you because they had something bad happen to them? Verse three, here's what Jesus said. He said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you think that might apply to situations we see in our world sometimes? Boy, I think we ought to be careful to jump to conclusion, conclusions like that. So I'm happy that this individual I, believes he can be so certain, but I think he's wrong. I really do. Someone commented as I was reading about this in the news, another Christian commented and said, well, if that happened to the Haitians because they're so sinful, then why hasn't it happened to him? How many of us have sinned? How many of us deserve eternal death? All of us. That's not to say that God doesn't protect his people. That's not to say that there will be judgments from God upon some who reject him at the end of time. But I think we need to be very careful that we don't start interpreting things that God has not necessarily given us the insight to interpret. So, question. If the Lord treated us as we treat others, what would our fate be? It's a thought question, but it's one that we ought to take to heart seriously. I need to take that to heart myself. Tuesday's lesson, moving on, if you're following along in your lesson, talking about sharing the gospel. And as we, as we um, continue on in our study here, patience in the gospel. And, and what they mean by this, I, I read this and I didn't quite understand what they were getting at until I started to look at some of the verses. And what they're saying is this. Um, when we share Jesus with other people, does, it, does that process require patience? And, and, and where they went with this in whoever wrote this Bible study that we're going through here with the Sabbath school lesson, they basically were saying this. They're saying, you know, truth is always plain to the person who is not looking at it through glasses tinted by false doctrine, tradition, family, and so forth. In other words, for us, we might be presenting the truth about the Sabbath to somebody, for example, and, and we can't figure out why in the world they just don't step over the line and start keeping the Sabbath, right? But even in this area, we need to be really patient, don't we? We need to exercise patience. And, and a good example is right here in Mark chapter 4, the, the uh, the verse, the parable of the sower. Let's go to Mark chapter 4, one of the parables, the many parables of the sower. There are different parables that have farming involved with them. Well, this is in uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, verses 26 all the way down through verse 29. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. The man goes out, he, he casts the seed on the soil. He goes to bed at night, verse 27, gets up in the morning, and the seeds sprout and grow. He doesn't know how, though. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And so they ask the question, all right, so you read this parable. Now, where do you see the sower here exercising patience? Do you see it anywhere in the story? First of all, he goes out and he sows the seed. And then what does he do, it says, after that? What's the next thing he does? Come on now, you can read. What does he do? Goes to bed. And is he laying awake all night worrying about that seed out there in the field? Doesn't tell us that he is, and I don't think he is, right? He goes to bed and he sleeps. And he just rests. He, he realizes that his job is to sow the seed. That seed goes down into the ground, maybe if it's, if it's hidden under a clod of dirt or whatever, and, and there's nothing that farmer can do at that point. Once he's done his job, he can't go out there and by watching it or worrying about it or, or blowing on it or doing whatever, he can't make it grow, can he? It's just going to grow because it's a miracle of God. In fact, our job is to sow the seed. God's job is to give the growth yeah and so going on it says um then he starts to see the little blade of of grass poking up through the the ground right there it is then finally it grows and then you can see the little the little part where the grain's going to grow there and then finally it matures and then it's ready to harvest and so sometimes we think you know if that person doesn't get it the first time i hand them a book about this subject they're hopeless 
We write them off, don't we? Got to be careful there. Uh, sometimes we think, you know, if that person, they, they, they backslid, that's it for them. Well, maybe, maybe God's a little more patient than we are with, with each other. I'm happy he is. And, and so the lesson basically brought this out. They said, um, we need to be careful. What is important is that in our zeal, we don't become a hindrance to someone. That is, we must not push so hard that the person gets turned off. Turned off. We can't force the little plant to grow, can we? Can we? The only thing we can do, I like what Ellen White says. She says it's by, by gentle, loving attention that a plant grows. You water it, you give it a little fertilizer. If it's a bush or a shrub or a tree, you might prune it. But those little things, God's the one who gives the growth. We do our job, we're patient. So there's patience involved with winning people to Jesus. Really, God's the one who wins people to Jesus. Sometimes we don't see results. It's discouraging. You know, we share the gospel with someone. We think, oh, that, you know, maybe we even lose contact with them. Don't hear from them again. I think it was Mark Finley. I, I was at a seminar one time, and he was talking about how to share Jesus with people. And he's an incredible guy. He, he talked about experience winning souls. Um, he, he has it. And he said this. He said, you know, it takes about 12 people on average, to bring one person to Christ. So don't get too worried if you don't see results right away. Maybe you're just one person in that process that will eventually lead that, that, that person to Jesus. Maybe, you know, and, and it, it's true. You know, somebody leaves a book somewhere, somebody else finds it. It's not till a few years later that, that that person then runs into somebody else who reminds them of the book and they've read it and now they're ready to take the next step in their journey. So, we need to just say, God, I'm going to do my job and I'll be patient with those who you are leading. Because God looks at not just the outward appearance, but he also looks at the heart, something that we can't see. So, going on. We're going to talk about God now and how patience has its limits. If you're following along again, we're on Wednesday's lesson here. Patience has its limits. Is that true? <laughs> Even though God is long-suffering, yet there are times when God's long-suffering has come to an end. He said, all right, listen, I can't do anything more. That's it. And in a, a prime example, of course, is the story of Noah and the flood. 120 years, God does what he can to reach the antediluvian world, but they did not want to be reached you know, yet in the midst of all of this, when God finally pulls the plug, I guess you could say, or I think probably the better illustration is he removes his protection and allows Satan to work his ruin. And of course, in the case of the flood, God actually sent the flood itself. Um, God, the Bible calls it, in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 21, it calls it God's strange act. It's really out of character for God to do this. God's not a God who enjoys watching people suffer. In fact, I think when the, the wicked are finally destroyed, God will be crying the biggest tears. He'll be crying the most because his heart, he created these people. He's the one who, who thought up their very DNA. He knows exactly what they're going to look like when they're born, and, and, and this, is, this is their father. He's crying the hardest. And so, yet his patience or his long-suffering does come to an end, I think in Genesis, if you go back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, notice what it says. It kind of gives us a picture into God's heart. It tells us what he was thinking here in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. The Lord said, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. I've been trying. I sent my Holy Spirit to work on their conscience, to woo them to me, to give them feelings of remorse. That, sometimes those are even from God. Repentance. I wanted to give it to them. They didn't want it. My spirit shall not always strive with man because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, nevertheless his days shall be 120 years. God realized that the opportunities that were given to the antediluvian world were being abused and were just causing the wicked to increase their guilt. And so in his mercy, God sent the flood upon the world of that day. Sodom and Gomorrah, Ancient Israel, other examples of God saying, listen, I, I just can't do anything more here. My patience 
has come to an end. And as you read those verses, I hope you did read those verses there, they gave us some references, um, and they said this. They said, what attitude on the part of the people prompted the consequences that the people suffered? And they gave us some verses, Deuteronomy 31, verse 27, and there the attitude of the people was they had a rebellious heart. They said, God, listen, we don't care what you think. We're going to do our own thing. Psalm 95, verse 8, what, what did that one say? Their heart was hardened. That's a tough thing. Jesus said at the end of time that uh, the hearts, the love of many would grow cold. I think it means their heart would become hardened. Jeremiah 17, verse 23, they stiffen their necks. Imagine what that looks like. We're not going to do this. We'll do what we want, God. And finally, in Matthew 23, a verse that was not in the lesson, uh, verses 37 through 39, Jesus, looking down from the Mount of Olives at Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets, you stone those I send to you, how often I would have gathered you under my wing like a mother hen does her chickens or chicks, but you would not. And so God had to turn away because God honors our choice. He does, ultimately. So application now. The, the lesson brought this out. They said, all right, so just because God's patience has a limit... Does that mean that we have permission to let ours run out as well? What do you think? Should we say, listen, I'm done with you. I think, you know, I have justification for this because God does this sometimes. Well, perhaps there is a time when we say, all right, I, I, I have dealt with this situation to the point where I can do nothing more and now I am, I'm done, I'm moving on. Maybe there are times that we should do that. But, but think about it like this. God's patience, does it go on for just a few days or a few hours, a few months or years? Oftentimes, his patience, it will go whole lifetimes, won't it? Whole generations of people. And, and so it, it's different, for example, than, than what we can actually, um, obviously that's not something that we can do. And so therefore, we need to be careful that we don't um, put ourselves in God's place and say, well, my patience can run out. I have a legitimate reason for that. Um, even if we do have a legitimate reason, does that mean that it gives us license to be cruel or judgmental or mean and unloving in the way that we deal with people? I don't think we ever have license to do that. I, the lesson said this. It said it might be time to take action, but that action never must be out of harmony with the principles of kindness, love, and caring. Very true. I'm dealing with a situation right now. Someone that... Um, we've helped in the past with giving them some money and things like that when they've needed it. And this individual, um, though, doesn't want to listen to counsel or advice, but wants to live life the way that they want it, even though they want to ask for, for help. And, and so I feel like, you know, if, if um, they're not really willing to listen to advice, then I don't know that it's good for me to continue to give them what they ask for. I don't know if it's healthy. I think it might be enabling them in their bad behavior. And so I've decided that I'm not going to give this person any more money because it's not helping them. And, uh, and I guess you can say, in a, in a sense, my patience has worn out with you know, I this particular situation. And yet, how I do that is important, right? If I do it in an unchristlike way, it's definitely not going to lead that person closer to Jesus. But if I can wrap my arm around this person and say, listen, you know what, I love you, but I just don't think it's the best thing for me to do to continue to enable your bad behavior, maybe that will be a way to go about the process. And so uh, these are things we have to wrestle with. There are no pat answers for how we deal with situations, but ultimately patience is probably the best way to go, isn't it? How we respond always should be in a way that is loving and um, Christ-like, regardless of what the situation may turn out to be. All right, so this is the most important one, Thursday's lesson, finishing up here today. Big question, how do we develop patience? Would you like to develop patience? Before you nod your head too quickly, you might want to think of what you're agreeing to here. And, and, and just for illustration, let's go to James chapter uh, 1, and this is a very... Uh, good example of how we learn patience. James chapter 1, little book of the New Testament there, right after the book of Hebrews, right before you get to Revelation. 
and as soon as I find it, we will read it. Here we go. James chapter 1 and verses 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into what? Various temptations or trials. Because the trying of your faith works what? Patience. Oh, there it is. The trying, the testing. And let patience have its perfect works that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So how do we get patience? One word, trials, also known as problems, difficulties. We've all had those before, haven't we? If you're a human being living in this world, you know what that is. What has been your experience with trials? Now, in my life, trials are the things that usually bring me closer to God and remind me of my utter dependence on him. I have realized in my life that the times when I am closest to God are usually the times when I'm going through the most difficult situations in my life. I don't like to admit that, but it's true. Because sometimes those things push us closer to God. They push us to our knees. So when I face problems with an attitude of faith, with, I'm in the midst of these problems, God says, all right, listen, you, know, you have a choice here. You can run away from me or you can run to me. Um, I have a choice to how I want to respond to this problem. Do I want to run to God? And if I run to God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to then live life in the midst of this problem with an attitude of faith, aren't I? Um, choosing to praise God even when I feel the exact opposite of happy, and I find that in the end I grow spiritually. Um, I remember a situation in my life, very difficult situation. Looking back on that situation, I actually, very unusual, I saw spiritual growth in my own life. You know what I'm saying? You look back and you're like, I've changed for the better. That's a good thing. God says, listen, I'm going to let you have some problems in your life, and if you respond to those problems, you'll grow. If you respond correctly, you'll, you'll grow spiritually. Trials are, trials are like going to the gym, right? You go to the gym, and you lift those weights, you work out on those exercise bicycles or treadmills or machines, and it's, they're supposed to build your muscles, and the muscle that we're building here is called patience. It's, it's building up our bodies so that we're, our character is more like Jesus, isn't that right? So, okay, just real quick here, finishing up, finishing up. Not all trials, though, are from God. True? Not all trials are from God. In fact, some trials are of our own making, aren't they? We sometimes create our own trials. Some come from our own disobedience, our own bad choices. There's something in this world called cause and effect. So there are different kinds of trials. And I think we need to be careful. We need to ask ourselves, wait, do, am I suffering this calamity in my life because of something I'm doing. And if there's something that we can change, God has given us guidance in his word, wisdom from other people that are helping us. Uh, if, if it's something we can change, then we should do that or else we can't expect that those trials are really going to bless us. Other trials, though, come from living in a world where we have an enemy who goes about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Isn't that right? He's, he's around. He's there. And he will send problems into our lives. God will allow him sometimes to make our lives difficult or just consequences of living in this world. Yet we can respond to those in a way that will help us to grow. So before we end... I want to make one more observation, that is this, that patience is ultimately the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit, and we haven't really talked very much about the Holy Spirit today in our lesson, but let's not forget that he is the one who must live in us, and this is how this all happens, and I want that in my life. I believe that you do too, that's why you're here today. I read something I wanted to share with you, it's a, one of my favorite little paragraphs of wisdom from the pen of inspiration. It says this. It says, the largest share of the annoyances of life, okay, things that we get annoyed by, the largest share, it's daily corroding cares. That's the worry, the fear about the future, you know, those things that we face every day. It's heartaches. It's irritation is the result of a temper uncontrolled. In other words, this is something we could actually change if we wanted to, okay? The government of self is the best government in the world. 
There's no legislation that can make you act like this. There's no rule out there that can make you change. It's the Holy Spirit working in your heart that is the best government that there is. By putting on the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, listen to this, 99 out of 100 of the troubles which so terribly embitter life might be saved. And so if this is true, first of all, I want to ask myself, listen, is there anything in my life, Lord, that I can do that will help me to live life um, more in harmony with your will so that I can avoid problems in my life? But listen, if there are problems in our life, which there will be, Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles. You'll have tribulations. When they come, how we respond to them makes all the difference. And um, so don't forget that God has promised us. He says, listen, when you do have problems, those problems that come from things that are out of your control, don't forget that I'll, I'll be with you and that I will grow you through this process.